All right. Uh, thanks everyone who's here to for joining our crack the code session. Um, what I've created for tonight um, is something that people can watch this and do later. Um, so the fact that we don't have a huge amount of people here isn't a big problem. Um, so it's there's a mix of presentation, some group um, or individual work that people can do, and then coming back together and thinking about it. Um, so I'm going to start with a quick presentation for folks. A lot of you have um, been involved through the zoning update process, so this is not going to be new to you, um, but I want to make sure to um, get to it um, just to give a brief um, reminder for anyone who is new um, new to the process and what we have going on. So I'm going to share the screen, uh, but I am also, the point of this is as to be as brief as possible while um, reminding people what we're doing. All right. Do All right, so this is pulled from the last presentation I gave. Oh, we got some people waiting. All right, um, this is a quick introduction to the full draft of the zoning update. We started say, with- Before you go on, do you have anybody co-hosting? Uh, no, I'll make you a co-host. Okay, just in case something happens to you. That would never happen. And you can help let people in from the waiting room. That'd be yes, great. Yes, that's true, yeah. All right. Um, so we are um, doing a quick synopsis of uh, what's in the zoning and why, why we're doing this. And then we'll get to the cracking part. All right, so the foundational question that we started this process with is do we like the change we're getting from the current zoning? There is no escape from change. Change is going to be happening all the time. We've been observing change in Danby for many decades. In fact, our town historian just dropped off um, a town survey that was done about 30 years ago by Sue Beaners. And it could have been this group yesterday giving those answers. Um, what are the things that are wrong in the town? It's losing its rural character. Uh, we don't have the services that we used to have that we wanted. We need a community center. We need more things for kids to do and for seniors to do. All of those answers, every single meeting we could ask them, we get those same things. Um, and we've been trying the same things for a long time and getting the same results. So it's time to try something different um, and we need to make significant change if we wanna change the outcomes. Um, so we've identified there are outcomes that we don't like. The town is losing its rural character. Um, in the, the areas outside of the hamlets. And we are, have lost um, most of the amenities and a lot of the character in the hamlets and wanna see more development and uh, investment there. So two goals come out of the change that we're seeing that we don't like, um, that we need to change our system for. One is to focus development in the central Danby hamlet and the west Danby hamlet want to make it as easy as possible to increase development and investment in the hamlets and get back some of those amenities and some of the community that were once there. Uh, we want to reduce clus and cluster development outside of the hamlets. So in the rural parts of the town, we want to keep them as rural as possible um, by reducing the total development and also clustering what does happen. Through this process of a large number of meetings, um, with uh, probably 30 to 50 people that have um, been at a lot of these meetings, uh, we've come to some big compromises. Um, in the Hamlets, uh, the proposed zoning is allowing significantly more than the current zoning does, uh, but there are more design regulations and more rules that ensure that what we get it has quality uh, without being overly onerous and without making things too expensive to build where we want people to build. Outside of the Hamlet, um, we have reduced the total development allowed um, significantly, 
but at the same time, we've increased flexibility that allows the de potential development that's there now to be done a little more easily and in clusters in ways that preserve significant contiguous open area. Um, we've created a transfer of development rights system that allows people to sell rather than build with their development rights um, and also uh, enabled more clustering. We already had clustering in the existing, um, existing zoning, but we're making it um, easier to do that and having some additional rules for it. So in the Hamlets, uh, we've created two zones, the Hamlet Center and Hamlet Neighborhood. We wanna keep the center small to encourage focus investment. Um, both of the zones are quite flexible because we want people to build here. This is the part of the town that we wanna see investment in. The Hamlet should be the easiest place to build and it's currently some of the hardest places. Um, key decisions we made, um, we agreed that allowing an increased amount of small scale housing, one to four units and businesses, small businesses can be done by right. Um, we agreed that we were gonna limit drive-throughs in the core areas, only allow it with strong site plan review outside um, and agreed that zone boundaries driven by a quarter mile and half mile circles from the key nodes in those hamlets would define what could become the neighborhoods um, to have a limit that's within walking or biking distance from the center. Um, added building and for form and tree requirements, um, parameters for parking placement um, to keep it a pedestrian friendly place. Outside the hamlet, we've gone from one zone, the low density residential zone that had been blanketed across the entire town to four zones. Um, we have the four zones are the existing low density residential, some areas that are already built out at that two acre density uh, will stay with that zoning. Um, a hamlet, or, sorry, a rural two, a rural one, and high priority preservation. And we'll walk through a table with those in a second. All right. Uh, we've also added three floating zones, um, buffers for streams, um, habitat corridors, um, and also a floating zone that would allow the town board to change the zoning on a parcel to support agricultural, um, commercial, and light industry. Um, in a small scale way that supports the local ag economy. Also added a bunch of site plan review parameters. This makes it hard to put things in a simple table. So we're gonna be looking at a simple table in a minute. It does not have any of these things, um, but these things apply anytime site plan review is required. Um, so uh, encouragement for driveways to be shared, minimize new road cuts, clustering of development rights, can be required by the planning board. Um, it is encouraged in all circumstances. Um, so if someone wanted to do a large lot subdivision, the planning board could require them to cluster small lots and preserve most of the land instead. Uh, minimizing development on class one and class two soils. Um, new development should be hidden or screened from the road and neighboring properties. Attach multiple dwelling units or preferred over separated dwelling units when you're doing multiple new um, housing developments. Views should be protected and impacts on views should be minimized. New development and new lots should be arranged to minimize fragmenting existing fields and habitat. Parking for more than four vehicles on a lot should be screened from view and from neighboring properties and exterior lighting is required to be dark sky compliant. Uh, we've also um, added a process for those commercial <clears throat> types that support, um, support agriculture and limiting garages. So that's a, the brief overview of the zoning. I'm going to get into today's work, which is... All right, can everybody see the full screen? Yep. All right, today we're gonna to take that code and we're gonna think about 
what are the worst possible things that could happen that we're worried could happen when we're changing the code? Um, there's a saying that uh, I, I think is really true and I like, which is that there's two things people hate, the way things are and change. Um, and we have to be cognizant of that. You know, we are proposing a different set of rules that is frightening and people are worried about the potential unintended consequences. We already have consequences, known consequences of our current code. So we have to compare the potential of um, doing nothing and doing something to try and make things better. And so while we're doing that, I've heard a lot of people say, I'm worried that we adopt a new code and something terrible is gonna happen. I know there's creative people out there that kind of come up with horrible ways to subvert the goals of this code. And I think we need to test it and find out that's what we're going to do today. I've put together two tables that sum up a lot of the zoning. It's not all in here. There's no way I can put everything in the zoning into a table. But the basic parameters of each of the zones are in this table where we have um, the density limits, the lot size limits, the front yard requirements, the side yard requirements, the rear yard requirements, and setbacks for new clusters. Sorry, this thing is going to be in the way no matter what I do, I think. Um, and then the second uh, table is about the transfer of development rights potential. So there is <clears throat> development rights, a multiplier. So we want to encourage people to transfer development rights um, from zone, some zones to other zones. So we're gonna give them more credit for going the direction that we want. So I see a, a typo. Um, the maximum number of residential units that could end up on a lot. And um, planning board, site plan review, what it's required for, and then additional requirements that apply. Also in this presentation is a link to the big map so that anyone who wants to get there um, can follow it and zoom in and zoom out on the map. And in a minute, I'm gonna give you all a link to go to a Google Slides version of this uh, presentation to do the work that we're gonna to do today. The next two slides is what you are all gonna to contribute to. So we're gonna work in Google Slides and I made a bunch of copies of this slide um, and you're gonna fill it out with your thoughts and ideas. So on each, each person is gonna take possession of some of their slides of their own and you can make copies. Um, you can do more of this outside of this meeting and send them to me. Um, each of these um, slides asks five things. Describe your terrible idea. So we have ones for good, good things that we want that we wanna make sure aren't prevented. And we have ones for bad things that we don't want that we wanna make sure are prevented. So this one is for the bad things we don't want. Describe your terrible idea. Um, so maybe what really worries you is that someone's gonna build a 30 story um, convention center tower and parking garage in West Danby and shadow your solar panels on your roof and make it so you can't grow tomatoes. So you would say, that's what I'm worried about. You describe that here. Something that you are concerned would be allowed by the, something you saw in the code. Um, if it applies to a particular zone or more than one zones, that's what you put in this zone. What zones might this terrible thing that you're concerned about be allowed in? The next question is, is this terrible idea or worse currently allowed? Um, so some things that you really don't wanna see happen might be allowed in the new code and also be allowed in the old code. Um, that's worth, worth thinking about. The fifth box or third box, excuse me, is describe why this would be a terrible idea for DMD. So, I want to give a little space for you to think about, you know, not everybody might think that that is a, something we should be worried about. So explain what's bad about it. Um, 
And then finally, what should we do to prevent this terrible idea from happening or how could it be mitigated? This could be changing the zoning. It could be adding some additional parameters. It could be taking uh, some different action by the town board. Um, but what are your ideas for how we could make it so that this terrible thing is not so bad? Um, Ted has a hand up. In, Ted, you have a question. Yeah, could you flip back to the slide that had the, divide, the multipliers on it? Um, we'll, we'll get to it in the Google slide, okay, Ted? Okay, I'll just tell you what my question was. I was reading through the um, proposed zoning and I missed, during discussions, we had a four times multiplier on at least one type of transfer and I didn't see it in your table there and it isn't in the zoning. Or maybe I did see it in the table, but it isn't in the, zone, the zoning. But we can, we can come back to it. All right, so um, the next piece is for good things. Um, so not only should we be concerned about preventing things that we don't want from, happen, from being allowed or from coming to town, um, there's also things that we wanna see uh, maybe that's um, developing businesses in the hamlets. Maybe it's affordable housing for all kinds of people. Um, maybe it's um, uh, protecting views that we want to see. So this is a place to describe something that you want to see happen. Um, and then check, is it allowed or does something in the zoning prevent it? Um, and then let's compare. Um, how does the current zoning, uh, if it creates a barrier, is that barrier more or less than the barriers in the existing code? So um, is the wonderful idea currently allowed? Um, next, describe why you feel this is a wonderful idea for Danby. Uh, again, not everybody might agree that um, whatever it is that you want is a wonderful idea. Um, so there, that's a chance to explain why we should be concerned if it's being prevented by the new code. Um, and finally, what should we do to enable or encourage, oh, another typo, this terrible idea, this wonderful idea to happen, how can it be supported? Um, I'm gonna drop a, oh. So what do we want to do with this? We want to brainstorm possible negative unintended consequences of the proposed zoning. We want to evaluate those scenarios and the code protections in it and how it compares to the existing code. And we want to provide feedback that the town board can consider. So I'm going to take each of these slides that you each contribute to, um, and then I'm going to create an additional slide that analyzes um, your concerns. And I hope that we'll have time um, for, for you to spend some time individually on some slides and then come back and talk about things as a group. Um, but I also want to want there to be room for you to sit on this a little bit, think about it, um, send me one tomorrow or the next day, um, send it to your friends and have them think about it and put together um, some of their concerns and send them to me. And then I'm gonna compile those and um, have an analysis slide. So some things that people are concerned about um, that might on their face look like they are allowed by the new code, maybe there's a provision that they didn't see that prevents or mitigates against that. Um, so I'm gonna provide that information. Um, and then I'm gonna provide that to the town board to consider what do they wanna do? It's it's their code to adopt. Um, so I need to give them um, feedback about concerns and um, possible ways to fix it and directions to go. Um, I wanna be clear that what we're not attempting to do tonight um, is rehash previous disagreements that have been kind of gone through and voted on. Um, I don't think that there's a lot of uh, purpose to that. We're not going to have a debate about the direction of the code or what people want in it. We're going to identify individuals' concerns 
um, analyze them and um, package that for the town board to decide where to go from there. We're also not gonna solve every problem in the world with zoning and definitely not with this meeting. And we're not gonna be rewriting the code or deciding on changes that are made tonight. Um, the goal is brainstorming concerns um, so that the next step can be evaluating um, how serious those concerns are, the things that we should do about them, if there's something that should change or not. Um, but we're not, we're not necessarily doing that tonight. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So I am going to get out of sharing and I'm gonna pop in the chat a link to a Google Slides version of that presentation. Let's see here. So how many people here have used Google Slides or don't know how to use Google Slides? If you're concerned about using Google Slides, put your hand up. I've never done it before. Doesn't mean you can't do it. Yeah. But <laughs> we'll give it a try. It's very similar to PowerPoint. That's not and very helpful. With, <laughs> so the, the link is now in the chat. And if you follow that, you will find you get into an editable version of the presentation. All right, I see that we have eight, eight people in the presentation. How many people do we have in here? All right, there's 13 people Thank in this meeting. Mm -hmm. What are we up to? Still have eight viewers. I got. It. All right, we just got one more person joining the meeting. Probably so I'm going to paste into the chat again because anyone who joins can only see what was in the chat after they joined. So I may be re-adding this link again if, as other people add. Um, so um, whoever just joined, I think it was Eric. If you want to follow the link in the chat, that'll get you to a, a Google version of the presentation. I'm going to screen share back to that. All right, uh, so I, I have the information that was in the slides um, for your background. And then you get down to the slides of the terrible ideas and the wonderful ideas. Um, you have the ability to start by adding your name. Um, and that's a way that you can claim a slide as yours to add information on. If we run out of slides, I can we can duplicate slides and just make as many more, an infinite number, um, as we need. Uh, but you're gonna you're gonna go ahead and and just type in information. Um, I think we may have a, a layer issue, so if you aren't able to click on the text, you can double click on the box. I think it should get you a text box. Yep, and then you can type in, my wonderful idea is. David, what do we do if, if like a person, a resident um, by the name of Wolf is typing something in and I don't really understand it, how do we gain some kind of clarification then? That's okay. So what we're gonna do is everybody gets their own slide. Um, mm -hmm. You type in, so there's multiple copies of those two slides over and over again in this presentation. Um, and I can keep making more copies of them. So you're gonna put in information in slides that nobody else is working on. We're gonna take maybe 10 minutes to do a first round of that and then um, come back together and um, talk through some of those. Um, I, I'm gonna be looking at them while you're typing and see if I can kind of um, see common things that uh, are similar, see if we need some clarification. 
Um, and hopefully we can start talking, uh, start evaluating, um, you know, are, are we finding problems with the code or are there answers already in the proposal that would help um, alleviate the concern either of something good being blocked or of something bad being allowed? Hmm. Does anybody else have a question? Uh, how do we choose which paper to write on? Yeah. So you can claim one that nobody's working on by starting at the name and contact portion at the bottom. Do so you see my screen here? I'm okay. gonna say this one's mine. And now that one- oh, Wait a minute, let's see. So Pat's got the, the first I, one. I guess I'm not sure how to choose one. I'm, I'm clicking on oh. some. Yeah, so you can just scroll down on the side here. Yes. To get to one that's blank that no one has put their name on yet. Okay. Um, and then, then what do I do? I double click? Double click in the box at the bottom that says name and contact and then type your name and then nobody else will type in your box oh. and they can find their own box. Um, that doesn't seem to work. I'm clicking, there's a nice clean one. And uh, I cannot write my name on it. <laughs> Let's see. Um, Is it your intent that the pages, the slides should be alternating um, terrible and wonderful? If you are... only have terrible ideas said, you can just copy and duplicate that one over and over again. But that is how I laid it out. Okay, Where are they what I'm finding is that people are claiming non-adjacent terribles and wonderful. I don't care what you're doing. It's just confusing. We'll work it out. What? Uh, okay. So they alternate wonderful and terrible, do they? They do. I see. Really, I'm not able to click and write. I'm not sure what I'm missing here. Uh, let me let me see here. So when you click on it, does it highlight like this? If you click just once? Uh, well, it, it's already highlighted, so. Oh, so uh, you need to. Right corner. Just click on me what about the right corner? Uh, does it show that you're logged in as you? Do you have a Google account for anything? Oh, you don't. You don't need to have a Google account or be logged in to do the editing. Um, okay. Camille, I think what could have been the issue is if you were clicking on the screen that I was sharing and not on your own version in your own web browser. If you were clicking in Zoom, that's why it wasn't working because that's that's okay. just you looking at the screen. Um, you need to go to the chat and follow the link to the Google document that you can open in your web browser and then you can edit it. Am I right? Was that the issue? Find it in your web browser. Um, I have three now that I have open in my web browser. Uh, okay, I think I got it. All right. Okay. Thank you. Yep. So you double click on it, dude. Yeah, if you double click on a box, it should um, then, create the option there. to add text. Um, Is that working for you, Joel? I'm working on finding an empty box. Um, OK. So I hear a question from somebody else. It was I, Catherine, just asking you. I did something just to do it. Does it show? Uh, let me look. <laughs> it's a you know what slide, idea. what slide number you are working on, Catherine? Um, describe your wonderful idea. No, yeah, I have what, no idea. What, what number <laughs> is it though? I don't know. I didn't. I didn't know. Let's see. It might be number five. Is that me? Nope. That's Nancy. Let's try. 
might be, it's six, I think. When it's little on the side, I. Oh, yep, I see. This is Catherine. Is this showing? Okay. Yep, okay. It's showing. Okay. Yeah. And then down underneath the name and contact, way down below, is that where we're supposed to put that? Name and contact? Yep. Okay. That's right. All right. Then I don't need to. Now, now that I'm done with that, can that be closed and somebody else use it? So somebody else will need to choose a different slide. Okay. Gotcha. All right. So we just had a bunch of folks join. A new people who um, don't have a clue what we're doing here. <laughs> that's all right. I'm going to explain it. Everybody else, if you want to mute me while you're working on your slides, that's fine. Um, but I'm going to explain what we're doing to the new folks that have joined. Uh, it looks like they're still kind of getting in. Um, so for everyone who joined, I'm adding now a link in the chat box. All right, so that link is to a Google Doc of a presentation that we are collectively editing. In that presentation, I'm going to share my screen. So you're going to follow the link that's in the chat to get into this editable presentation. Um, I walked through some basics of the zoning um, that's in here just to remind people what the basic rules are. There are many more rules in the code. So um, this is just a, a quick reminder um, of some of the basic parameters, uh, as well as a link to the big map. Now in the presentation below those three slides, um, there is an alternating uh, array of two different cards. One card for terrible ideas, um, things that we definitely do not want to see in Dandy that we're concerned the zoning change might allow. And also maybe concerned that the current zoning allows them. Um, so you're going to uh, choose a card and the way you choose a card, this one that's on the screen now, Pat Woodworth has chosen this card. It's her card, she put her name on it. Um, if you're looking for a card to describe a terrible idea, you'll have to uh, scroll down and find a blank one like this one where nobody's put their name there and double click on that box and put in your name. That will claim that box for you. You can edit it. Nobody else will edit it. Please don't edit anybody else's cards um, because that's one of the drawbacks of the system is everybody can edit. And um, we're just gonna be good neighbors and not do that to each other. So you're gonna find um, blank cards with no name, add your name on them. Uh, there are cards for terrible ideas, that things that we don't wanna see. And there are cards for good things that we do want to see, that we want to make sure the zoning um, change doesn't make harder or impossible. Um, we, it's important to think about both of these things. We don't want zoning that prevents the good stuff that we want. We also don't want zoning that allows the bad stuff that we don't want. Um, you are doing this as a brainstorming project. Um, we are going to spend some more time on it and then come back as a group and kind of go through some of the concerns and evaluate them against the proposal and see, are there, is this something that really could happen or that really would be blocked? Um, and what are the potential impacts? Can we do more than one? Is anybody? Uh... Yeah, do as many as you want. I can just keep making more. Yeah, actually, you can make your own if you want to right click and just say duplicate. You can make your own, and that way you've already got your name on it and contact information and whatever. Yep.
I can't reach my mute button. Sorry, it's hidden. <laughs> I'll mute you. Of course, now you can't meet your unmute button either. <laughs> um, I'm seeing so, some new people come in. I think some of them just got bounced out, but if you need an explanation of what you're doing, let me know. Right. Yeah, Dave, I, I, I started out being able to write in it and then uh, I get kicked out and we can't, we can't write in it. Um, so anyway, that's, that's our good connection, I'm sure. Okay. Do you want me to send you the link again? Is that the issue? No. Well, I no. Just, I know because I got in and out like three times, but I couldn't. Okay. I'm not able to. Um, I, I started out fine, and then it then it kicked me out, and I hadn't been able to do it since. It's the connection issue. It's the connection. So. Okay. Well, sure I'm, just, like I'm, gonna, I'm gonna put this on the um, planning department uh, portion of the new town website under the zoning update. And you can even print these out and fill them out and send me a picture of them or drop them off at the office. In a webinar. Yeah, you can talk on this. Okay. Huh. So, so you got it. So you got it. So you got it. So all right, John, I had to mute you because we were getting a feedback loop. What would you say is a, what would you say is a, a Yeah, is there any way you can mute that conversation? Yeah. <laughs> Olivia, I'm going to mute you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Olivia, can you hear me? Yeah. I thought it was interesting. Yeah. I couldn't really hear what she was saying, but. So are, are folks still working on putting in more? Yep. Or do we want to stop and think about it? We got one more. A little time.
Hey, David, as long as everyone else is typing away, could you uh, take a look at your slide with the multiplier on it? I think you've got stuff backwards, at least. Yeah, that's quite possible. You have a multiplier of four in rural two Unless I misunderstand it. Yeah, that must have been copying. It's kind of a copying and pasting issue. So I'm going to update that. Got the code and, open. And um, as I read the zoning proposal itself, uh, the four times multiplier doesn't show up anywhere. I didn't see it either. What is the resolution? This one. Oh. Four. Multiplier. One. Yeah, I must have been copying from an older proposal. Let's see here. There is a multiplier of two from rural one to uh, rural two or low density. See, what section is that, Tim? Uh, that is in 1406. 1406, yes. And then the same information is repeated in somewhat in a different format in 1407. How many pages into it is that? It's page 87 if you uh, knock out the um, David's original changes. I couldn't tell you what page it is <laughs> before you knock it out. It's near the end. In the red line version? Mm -hmm. very, very near the end. Section what again? What, what section? 1406 and seven. In seven. There isn't any such section. Oh yeah, that's good. Article seven doesn't have art. It's article um, 14. <laughs> Article 14, no, yeah. near the end. right at the end, maybe a page or two from the end. How are folks doing on the cards? I'm good. 
Anybody else feel like they need more time right now or we want to start looking through them? I'm excited to see what people have yeah. written. Yeah, let's look. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and we can roll through some of these. All right, a terrible idea from Nancy. Nancy's concerned about the selling of development rights and that it could create too much density that could have negative impacts. Um, seems like more density than is allowed now. Uh, just clarify, um, because we're requiring so much more acres per development unit, we are cutting the development potential by more than half. Um, concern there too much density and too much houses close together. Maybe we shouldn't allow so many development units to be allowed. So this is not necessarily an outcome, but is explanation of a concern. Um, a wonderful idea. Catherine, I wanted to have um, a quiet draw in one or both of our Hamlet cores that could bring people to spend time in DD, generate newcomers, perhaps link the draw with points of interest and pathways, um, supporting businesses, coffee shop, gift shop. Yes, it is showing, Catherine. Zones where it could be allowed, we could allow this anywhere, thinking we wanna bring people and maybe business to the Hamlets. Is it currently allowed? Um, not sure, but probably. Um, how could it be supported? Look at available space or property and consider ideas for use. Describe why this is wonderful. We need some exciting reasons for people to come to DMD. When we're talking about property at the core, it currently has frontage on the highway. Um, it would be, could help spur other ideas. So we wanna make sure that the code um, does make it easier for businesses, especially in the Hamlet. Um, so we can think about how that compares to current rules. Next idea, Pat, what would be terrible? Lots of traffic where we might get lots of traffic. Um, rural one and rural two. Um, could we get worse from our current code? Yes. Nancy, I'm concerned about the lack of road frontage for new lots. Will this create more flag lots and development in areas that are now not available for development? Where could this happen in all areas? Describe why this is terrible. It would create more development in areas that are now protected. And what should we do to prevent it? We should require road frontage in order to keep development on the road and not in the wild areas. Eric, well, it would be a wonderful idea. I want to sell a one acre lot to a small scale organic farmer who wants to farm it and build a small home. Uh, where in the ag zone? Um, why would this be wonderful? Food security is key to our future. What should we do to enable this? Make sure that no matter how small the starting lots and road frontage is, you can sell small pieces of land to a farmer. Um, is this currently allowed by the zoning? Um, I think it is lot size and frontage dependent. So currently you would not be able to sell a one acre lot in most of the town to build a house on. Um, you would have to have an average density of five acres and no lot be smaller than two acres with at least 200 feet of road frontage under the current rules. Um, I wanna build 10 houses on half an acre of a 10 acre lot and farm the rest in the ag zone. I'm guessing, um, Eric, we're talking about the low density residential zone. Um, which is most of the town right now. Um, food security is key to our future, is why it's a good idea. Uh, what should we do? Make sure that no matter how small the starting lots and road frontage that you can build clustered housing. Is it currently allowed based on White Hawk? I think so, we wanna be sure how small can this be? Um, so this is something that um, 
that we talked about a bit of allowing clustering um, on a lot. Just to be clear, what we're proposing requiring is um, 10 acres or 10 acres worth of development rights per um, house. So you could build 10 houses on a 10 acre lot and cluster them, probably not on as small as half an acre, it would be difficult. Um, but to do that, you would have to buy development rights that per preserve 10 acres per one of those lots. So that would be 100 acres of development rights um, or use, using the multiplier um, by those development rights from um, one of the places where we're really trying to encourage development in the rural one, um, which has a multiplier. And it would be even better if it's on a, a um, a minimum maintenance road because you get a bigger benefit there and we want to see those places preserved. Um, another, I want to build a processing facility for hemp or nuts or whatever. Um, it could have traffic and be noisy. Um, where should it be allowed? Ag zone, perhaps only along 96B and 96. Why um, would it be good? support small business cooperatives, value added processing. What could we change or do to enable this to happen? Um, make sure it's not going to bother neighbors yet we can't be too restrictive so that it has nowhere to happen. Um, next is a terrible idea concern from Ted. Um, what's the terrible idea? Lack of required road frontage. Um, what we're really, looking for it just as you're thinking about doing more of these is what is the outcome? What are we worried is going to happen? Not what don't we like in the code, but what would happen because of that? Um, so I think the concern here is that we would have more houses or have narrow lots that are frequent along um, a road. And that's something that we can evaluate what would the negative outcome be. Um, where would this be allowed in most zones? Describe why this would be terrible. It would encourage development in most all areas that is similar to or worse than existing on-road density in our most dense regions. Use of shared driveways, which is specifically encouraged, will encourage checkerboard properties stacking, stacking one behind the other. Frontage requirements prevent this. This will further fragment habitat zones. How could it be mitigated? Implement minimum road frontage. Is it in the current zoning? Um, it's worse. There's less frontage required, I'm guessing, in the proposed zoning because the proposed zoning requires much larger lots but does not do limits based on road frontage. Got a blank one. Let's see, describe a wonderful idea. Um, provisions that act to protect the properties, environment, and quality of life of existing property owners. Where should it be? Everywhere. Describe what's wonderful. While change is inevitable, we don't want to alienate existing residents by taking away something they've become used to. Zoning doesn't protect the interests and rights of property owners. Um, how could it be supported? Increasing yards on all sides, site criteria that give strong voice to existing residents. Um, describe something terrible, Ben Altman. On a 20 acre property with 250 feet of road frontage, rural one or rural two, current code allows on a, a one residence, I think, new code would allow two and with transfer many more in, that's in the rural one and rural two zones. Describe why this is a terrible idea. This does not seem to be maintaining open space. Um, how should we prevent this with a road frontage requirement? Um, is this currently allowed? I don't think so. Um, so one thing I wanna um, clear up just about what's currently allowed. Um, what's currently allowed is to break every parcel in town into five acre pieces. Um, and you can do so by adding new road frontage wherever you want. So if you had a hundred acres, it could be broken into 20 lots um, with a road. What we've proposed is doubling that required size, so it would be half as many 
lots um, and then encouraging them to be clustered. So just so everyone um, understands where we're going with that. Um, Cluster is also currently encouraged though. It is. We're not seeing a lot of it. No, we're not seeing a lot of development period in that, yeah. that type. So should the zoning uh, ordinance cover building of roads into unbroken up lots in some way? If that's what's causing the problem. I'm having trouble here, you Ben. I, I wondered if uh, you could uh, include something in the zoning ordinance to prevent that building of roads into existing lots to, to uh, break them up. We cert there certainly is possible to limit um, roads. One of the one of the things that we have to be mindful of is um, the legal challenges to the zoning and people's property rights. And so we need to make sure that if something's allowed, that means someone is has to have a way to be able to build that level of density if it's allowed in the zoning. So we, we are trying to get the level of density that we allow more in line with what we um, want to see um, than the smaller, the higher density that's currently allowed. Um, and part of that is a trade-off. And I think we've that's something we've discussed a lot in the meetings is we have a trade-off between property rights and um, people who want to be able to do what they want with their property and people who've invested in their property and want to be able to sell it and parcel it off um, and people who want to see the land preserved. And so we're trying to find ways that we can um, find a compromise that still allows some development rights to be used from a property while also making sure we have some big pieces and the, that character left. I don't want to get too far off on that while we're going through our thoughts here. Um, you know, absent the, uh, the frontage requirement, uh, there is, it opens up the possibility of, of shared driveways and driveways at all, accessing this, that, that back acreage, which has currently been undeveloped just because of the expense of putting in a road. Um, but the expense of putting in the driveways is not insignificant, particularly when you start proliferating number of houses that are on it, um, because the minimum requirements of the building code for fire and emergency vehicle access are, are pretty um, significant uh, inhibition for long driveways. Yeah, yeah. That, that um, is true, but the, compared to the cost of the house itself, uh, a ten or twenty thousand dollar driveway is not prohibitive. Um, I, I think Joel is making a good point that once you start stacking properties like that, you're talking about a driveway that is like a road. So, if someone can do it with a road now, um, if if it's cost prohibitive to build a road now, it's very similar in price to build a long driveway. Um, we're gonna we're gonna keep going with these good and bad ideas. What would we like to see? Um, a place to buy pastries and goodies in town, buy fresh produce in town. Where should it be allowed in the Hamlet Center and neighborhood? Um, what should we do? We should make it easy to start such a business. Um, we're definitely making that easier in the proposed code in the hamlets. Um, what is terrible? Single wide manufactured homes are allowed um, everywhere. Where might this be allowed? Everywhere. Um, so I do want to explain why this change was made. And that's because state law, fair housing case law has said it is a fair housing violation to discriminate against people based on how their house is made and towns may not consider single wide or double wide manufactured homes as something any different than a regular home because it discriminates against poor people. Um, and it's the most affordable housing that's available to a lot of people. So that's why the change has been made um, because we're not allowed to do that. 
Um, so, do the design standards address that though? Well, you could, we could have design standards that try to find a way around the fair housing um, court case that said zoning against manufactured homes is discrimination. Um, it's not the fact that they're manufactured that makes them unattractive, it's the form. Right, but it's the fact that they're long it's the fact well, single that wise are long and skinny. We already decided long since ago that the you know the double wide manufactured home is no different in terms of its appearance in the landscape as a double wide modular mm -hmm. or any other house. And so we right. don't discriminate against them. But but we but they're we, long and wide in order to transport them along the road. Well double wides are long and wide only because they're in two pieces. Right. So that was not, you know, that was not a defining or limiting criterion, but but we did we did say no single wides. And and it's only because the single wides look like trailers. What's the chance of what's the chance of continuing through the slides for, for a while? Yeah, I think that's a, a good sure. idea. Anyway, I'm raising the issue. <laughs> What would be wonderful that these changes come to a public <laughs> vote, um, which is where we're going. The town board will have to vote to make these changes. Well, I think yeah, Debbie's saying no. Vote. I think Debbie's suggesting a referendum as opposed to a pub town town board vote, yeah. and that we can't do. Mm. Yeah. Um, and why would that be wonderful? Um, Debbie says, I do not believe people know about these changes and how it may affect them. Debbie, we'd love to have you share this. We want and have been doing everything we can to get as many people involved as possible. Um, and feel free to reach out to me if you need more information about that. Um, next, Olivia, describe what is terrible subdivisions and rural zones that will add appreciable traffic due to new cluster density. Mm -hmm. Where might this happen? Wherever clustered subdivisions are permitted. Why would this be terrible? Traffic is already a major detractor to quality of life of people and animals. What should we do to prevent it? Um, not sure there's a solution. However, improved traffic calming measures and enforcement would be a move in the right direction. Hmm. I actually agree with Olivia on that. I don't know how many other people agree, but I think she's spot on. <laughs> I do. I do think it's worth pointing out that the more you cluster things, the less traffic there is. It's actually spreading things out that creates traffic because people have to drive farther. So the the most traffic that we could create would be by spreading everything out to the maximum extent. And the least traffic you create is when you cluster it together. Well, but that's, let's just say that the people behind me with 30 acres decide to put a clustered subdivision on there when, you know, normally they would have to divide it into regular parcels. Well, right. So right now with 30 acres, and we're going to jump through this quickly, but right now they could make six lots. Under the proposed zoning, they could make three lots um, and they could cluster them in one part. So I think it's definitely less that's allowed under the proposed zoning. Unless they um, buy development rights, of course. Yes, well, yeah, but they would be buying development rights. Right. The, where the place that they're buying them from also currently has the right to develop twice as much. David, if Eric were to realize his wonderful idea and I happen to agree with him about mm -hmm. his wonderful idea, it would have a major impact on the traffic on East Miller Road and would further deteriorate my quality of life to the point that I would have to look at selling because already the traffic is so bad and so you know, frighteningly fast that it, it, it you, you can't have an agricultural business where you have, you know, animals crossing the road or people crossing the road because of the volume and the speed. And so mm. while I fully support Eric's idea of being able to cluster some kind of housing at the top of Miller Road there, I 
it would it would have a horrific impact on me downstream. I think that's a, the reason why we need to lower the speed limit over mo most of the town to 45 miles an hour. Rhonda, it's not it's it's not it, there has to be enforcement that and we see on it, on Comfort Road it's 35 miles an hour. Nobody pays attention to it. Everybody just speeds. Nobody the only place I do. I do. Well, the most I do as well, but the only place it's enforced is on 96 feet. On the back roads, you go from the town of Ithaca at 35 and suddenly it's like end of speed zone. You know, now you're in Danby. Now you can speed up like a crazy person once you cross Nelson. So, I mean, unless we do something very significant in terms of, you know, speed bumps, you know, crosswalks, whatever it is, adding these you know, additional housing units in the rural areas of Danby, it's going to make it miserable for a lot of people. So I, Could I suggest I, that I, in 2022, Rhonda, Rhonda, we, have Rhonda, a, we have a meeting about this. So we need to get back on track here because we're getting far off of what we were working on. I wanna be sure that we're being clear that the proposed zoning cuts the allowed density in half. It allows actually less than half of what is currently allowed. Um, so I want to make sure people are understanding that we are allowing some of it to be clustered close to the currently allowed density, um, but it, it currently cuts the total development potential of most of the town in half or more, depending on the zone. But um, as, you, as you're hearing from some of the comments here, it increases the practicable density locally over, right. over what we have now. It's yeah. not it's average not and local right. density are different. Yeah, it is, it is different. Average and local is different. And what creates traffic is average. Um, Depends whether you're all, local to where the development is, doesn't it? Yeah. It, um, it, what and, creates, and nothing that we're talking about here is a significant generator of traffic compared to the volumes of traffic that we already have. Um, but I think we're, we're getting far away from addressing the, the slides that we have to look at here. Um, so what does Camille want to see? Um, have more clustered residential zones like Eco Village, even if not ecologically focused. Where should this be allowed? Um, high and middle density zones why would this be wonderful? There could be more development in keeping with true low density zoning and rural character. Is it currently allowed? Yes, it was allowed at Eco Village. Um, since a, a couple of people have mentioned Eco Village, I wanna say that Eco Village doesn't comply with any of our existing zoning. It's much closer to the proposed zoning. Um, I meant and, uh, uh, White Hawk. Yeah, yes. yeah, White, yeah, yeah, White Hawk basically did, they did a PDZ, which is a kind of, choose your own adventure of zoning where you propose new zoning for your parcel and the town board decides if they like it or not. And what they propose um, for Eco Village is much closer to what the proposed zoning change allows than what's currently allowed. The current rules wouldn't allow Eco Village at all. Or the current, um, rules allow this PDZ exception sort of thing? Uh, yes, yep. Um, okay, next under the, one. Can under you... the new rules, there would be less need to do a PDZ because you could do that kind of clustering within the allowed framework. Yeah, and it's very hard and expensive to do a PDZ. It takes many months of meetings and lawyers and um, can be quite complicated. I actually have two banker's boxes of paperwork in my office from when that PDZ was adopted, and I know. Um, it took them a whole lot of time and a lot of meetings and difficult things. And I think it, it was a great outcome, um, but the, the proposed zoning makes that kind of development um, more of a possibility without that expense. Um, all right, next terrible idea, uh, that all agreed regulations and zoning can be altered by requesting a variance. Perhaps there's rules for processing this, I'm not aware of, but I was aware of the land development on the future and hollow and the variance there, and it was scary. Where might this be allowed in high density areas? 
Um, why would having variances be a terrible idea if we're trying to keep the rural character and we allow big variances in the low density residential? It's worrisome. Um, what should we do to prevent this from happening? Large variances should have a town board meeting. And I remember that this has happened before a number of times. So it seems like this is an issue addressed in some instances. Um, to Puchin Hollow, the project fell through from the part of the buyer, not the zoning laws. Oh, I, I'm guessing that's the Marsh and Puchin Hollow property. Um, they actually didn't get a variance. Um, but I'd be happy to talk to you more about that offline, Camille. Okay. Um, okay, next one, Olivia. What would be wonderful? Encourage large land holding with tax breaks linked with a number of years maintained into large acreage land or support land trusts with uh, perpetuity tax breaks. Where could it be allowed low density and rural one and two? describe why is it wonderful there are no incentives to keep large lands unbroken lands and they get fractured over time as owners sell or die um, we should develop strong and varied incentives is it currently allowed um, some of it is being explored um, yes we asked the state to pass a law allowing us to do some of that and the state passed it as far as i know the governor hasn't yet signed it but then it will be yeah, up how to much, the town. Do you know when the, how much time the governor has to sign it? Um, to be honest, I haven't been on top of that, so I'm not sure. That's Some not one that I wrote, unfortunately. That's, I mean, it sounds great, but it's not one that I... Um, I wrote I, it. I don't know how Olivia's name got there, but I wrote <laughs> It's it. great, Camille. I appreciate it, but I don't want to take credit for that. <laughs> yeah. Thank for, you. For what it's worth, I understood, I was told at one time that the reason that um, uh, Cuomo resigned when he did was that it was the last day that certain bills could be signed, including ours. And so if he, if he didn't sign it, and that is correct, they have to start again. That may be the case. I'm, I just don't have a good answer. Next slide. Oh, that was Something that is terrible. You describe a terrible idea. The absence of a defined limit on how many people constitute a dwelling unit results in proliferation of rooming houses. Where could this happen? Rural one, rural two, and low density residential. Why would this be terrible? It would subvert the density reducing intent of the rezoning. Um, what should we do to prevent it? A dwelling unit needs to be carefully defined. Joel, what's the problem with that? I don't understand. Why, why wouldn't you want to have um, a rooming house? It was traditional in, in agricultural historic I'm just, think, I'm just imagining, you know, a, 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 we were just talking about the impacts of increased traffic from development. And if you, if you don't have a, any limit on what, a, what constitutes a dwelling unit, limiting the number of dwelling units doesn't limit your density. You know, I'll, uh, a, a building divided in dormitory style buildings could introduce a lot of traffic and a lot of people um, without mm -hmm. any real cap on it. Hmm. So that might be something more for the neighborhood, the neighborhood term. So you're talking about kind of like university housing. Going yeah, I mean, right now we have, we have this one and two family um, uh, thing in our in our zoning, which we all agreed, you know, that 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 the definition of family is antiquated and ought to be replaced by simply defining what a dwelling unit is. Uh, and right now, if a family can be in of any size, if they're related by blood, the reality is that family size has been falling uh, for a century, and it's about two and a half people currently. Um, if you take away the related by blood and, and substitute a dwelling unit as, you know, unrelated, a number of unrelated people living together, sharing, you know, a kitchen or something, um, you have to be careful about how many people that is, or it could easily greatly increase the density that's allowed in any neighborhood. Hmm. And so I, I think that's something to consider. We should think about how likely a lot of that is. Um, and what limits we want to put on it. 
Do the parking regulations existing in the uh, current proposal uh, affect this greatly? No. Uh, there's really not any substantive um, need for a regulation of the number of parking spaces on 10 acre lots. People aren't, aren't actually building parking spaces. They just park where they want to. Um, this so, next one. Do, do you have some idea how you, you might replace the family uh, definition? Because uh, I mean, yeah, we've been to, discussing if you go to, um, go to room size, number of rooms or something. Then yeah, that those that's, are that's there difficult. Was a good discussion because, at, the, at the town board meeting. I was focused on planning last time, which is why I raised this as a concern because it, it, it came up at, by, at the town board. Seems like a pretty hard thing to define because. You know, somebody might want a mansion with 20 rooms and have two people in it. Right, exactly. Well, and that Which is what's currently allowed. In the, in the neighborhood, in the Hamlet neighborhood, but not necessarily in rural zones. Right, right. right. So that is what we talked about. The various limitations you could have if what you're trying to limit is density, is you could limit the number of people per building or per uh, dwelling unit and because we're allowing clustering and clustering can happen in a building if the limit is five and you want to have 10 then you get two development rights preserve 20 acres worth of land and you can put 20 people in a building you want 30 people in a building preserve 30 acres of land how um, on earth are you going to monitor and enforce how many people are in a building uh, oh. the same way we currently monitor and enforce whether or not the people in a building are related <laughs> which is uh, not right <laughs> which is when people complain that's in, that's in rural areas not in the hamlet core or neighborhood right um what what we're talking about is right now um, housing density is regulated by um fam families is uh anyone who's related you can have an infinite number of people in any building that's built um, by people who are not related are not considered a family. Um, there's, I think it's two or three is the maximum. And what we talked about is um, that being an antiquated way of dealing with it and needing a different definition for what a dwelling unit is. When we talk about how many dwelling units can be on a property and that could be done with size. We could say a dwelling unit is no more than 5,000 square feet. And if you wanna build one, if you say you need a 10,000 square foot house, then that's two dwelling units and you need the development rights to build two dwelling units. Um, it could be by the number of people, it could be by the number of bedrooms. Those are three ways that you could do it without relying on deciding who is and who isn't a family. Um, but that, that actual um, a solution to that hasn't been proposed yet. So I don't wanna to get too far off base. You could also, um talk about a, uh, a building that's suitable for a family of five or something without actually mm. requiring mm -hmm. it to be a family. Sure. Yeah. Just as a suggestion. Mm. If I could go back uh, one slide just for a moment. Um, uh, the idea of incentives came up and that's something that I think uh, should be explored further. Um, I mean, we do have some kind of incentive structure uh, developing with the um, um, uh, conservation easements. But it, it seems like a lot of this uh, needs some incentives, both in the high density and in the low density zones. And maybe can you, incentives can you imagine, Ben, any alternative way to incentivize? Uh, I haven't put a lot of thought into it, but um, I mean, the, 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 the tax uh, incentives for not breaking up properties is a really good idea, I would say. Yeah. Um, but uh, I can think about it more. If you can come up with an alternative, that would be worth adding to the mix because so far that's the only real uh, consideration that's been seriously under. Yeah. And I just say the important things in considering an incentive is is the incentive enough to change someone's action? Who's paying for that incentive? because whoever's getting it, somebody else in town is paying for it. Mm -hmm. um, and then are those people getting what they paid for? 
you know, is there's the incentive, and does the incentive turn out to be perverse? <laughs> right. <laughs> and can cause un undesired problems. Or are you giving money from one group to another group and not actually affecting any change? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Those are all important parts of it. All right. We were on to Joel's next one. What would be wonderful? Commercial enterprises of low impact could be allowed just about everywhere. We should see this everywhere. Um, why would this be good? More flexibility for business owners and greater access for residents to businesses. Uh, what should we do? Um, allow businesses that would be allowed as home occupations to be allowed, even if not accessory um, to a residential use of the property. Um, how is it currently allowed? It's only currently allowed as an accessory to residential use. I actually disagree with that. Um, you Rhonda, know, we, we're not, Rhonda, we're not debating these. We're reading people's uh, comments. So the next is from Guillermo. Uh, a, what would be wonderful? A small business district with reasonably sized stores and food markets under square, under 4,000 square foot, possibly. Where should it be allowed? Only in the Hamlet high density area. Um, why is it wonderful? Amenities within walking and biking, short driving distances to reduce miles driven to shops in Ithaca. Um, how can we encourage it? Um, wonderful idea. Not sure about how to attract businesses except to create business zone and limit building size in it. Um, you should check out our Hamlet Center Zone um, where we have allowed um, small businesses as a by right use if they're small enough. Um, they can just get a building permit and build, and then bigger things need to go through site plan review. But we're trying to make it easier for people to do that in the Hamlet specifically with caps on size and requirements for being people friendly in the Hamlet sort of development. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to talk about it later if you'd like. Um, another uh, good idea from Guillermo, um, a well thought out solar regulation that encourages development larger than two megawatts on appropriate land? Where should it be allowed? Maybe a rural one and rural two. Um, why is it a wonderful idea? We need more distributed generation statewide. Um, what should we do to enable and encourage it? Um, a well thought out regulation that allows development on certain land while not being overly limited with protections for runoff, neighbors, view shed, et cetera. Um, isn't currently allowed, um, possibly allowed, haven't seen written regs. Um, there is, gosh, I'm trying to remember the section number. It might be 700 um, the end, anyway. of the current current zoning. Um, we have it, we do have a section on large scale solar. Um, yeah, it's section. 414 and section 808 um, both deal with, with how that currently works. So you're welcome to check that out. Let's see, get back to the- that Part of the zoning also needs to be reviewed because it's there's a lot of ambiguity in it, which came up when we were talking about the solar, solar installation um, by Mark Berger. Mm -hmm. um, you know, definitions about large scale and commercial and facility mm -hmm. and system. So at some point it would be great if, you know, a group of people in Danny would get together and actually go through that really, really careful, carefully so that, you know, it's the definitions are a lot clearer. Okay. Um, all right, Catherine. Uh, what would be terrible if a large family had many airplanes and used them for tourism and had many takeoffs every day? Um, where might this be allowed? I think airstrips are possibly allowed everywhere. Um, they are allowed in the low density residential zone, which is 90 plus percent of the town currently. Um, describe why it would be terrible, it would be noisy and disturb wildlife. Um, what could be done to prevent it? How could it be mitigated? It's possible that zoning might already limit it, but I did not see how. Mm -hmm. um, so believe it, 
it is allowed as an accessory use in some places and it would be subject to um, review by the town. Um, I'm not sure how it originally ended up in the zoning, but it has been there for a very long time. And I think there's one, maybe used to be two in town. Mm -hmm. Uh, Catherine again, um, terrible idea. Can the BZA overrule some of the things that zoning will limit, i.e. the number of outbuildings? Just wondering. Um, yes, the BZA can and um, is by state law required to exist to um, provide relief from um, rules when there is a specific hardship to a property owner and the test that the BZA has to apply when they consider someone's request for a variance is, um, will the benefit to the applicant, the person asking for the variance, outweigh the detriment to the neighborhood? Um, and that's a part of our state constitution that requires there to be a BZA and requires the possibility for relief um, in special circumstances. Um, and then it, it really comes down to how the BZA chooses to weigh the various, there's a five point test that they use. Um, I don't wanna get too off topic, but feel free to ask me if you have more questions about that. Um, something terrible, roadside stands limited to products within 10 miles. Um, so I think that that is, um, in relation to the definition of roadside stands in the zoning. I don't think it's changed, um, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, I think that's right. It's the same in both now and proposed. Yeah. yeah. Um, something terrible, um, creating another water district in Danby. Okay. Uh, just sorry, just to go back to the roadside stands, that's something that I called out in my comments as mm -hmm. well, because it seemed to me that organic produce gets, for instance, gets uh, grown all over, I don't know, let's just say Tompkins County, and a lot of that is more than 10 miles away from a lot of Danby. I mean, one end of Danby is more than 10 miles away from the other end. Sure. Uh, so that I does think seem that... like a, a, a really onerous restriction. Yeah. So I, just to, to be clear, Ben, and for other people who saw that, um, basically that is an out from all the regular review that would happen for a commercial business. So it's designed to give a special extra low barrier of entry to someone who's basically selling their own produce. Um, someone else who wanted to just have a, a store you just can just process it as a business where businesses are allowed or as a home occupation, there's still a process for that. There's just an extra, extra low barrier to entry for um, those roadside stands that have a much smaller size requirement and the tighter um, distance. So of course people can still create a place to sell produce that comes from farther than 10 miles away just is treated like what it is, which is a store. Thanks. Yep. Um, so that is the, that's the last slide um, that, we've, that we've put together here. Um, how are we doing on time? I just added one more at the very end, David. I had one in as well that didn't get covered. Um, you know what number it was? Ted, is this, this the one you're talking about? Yeah. So if you added while I was talking, obviously we may have passed things, but um, what's a terrible idea allowing processing of products from within a hundred mile area? Um, where is that allowed? I don't know. Um, why would it be terrible? It would make DMB a processing hub, and that would inevitably lead to the businesses growing and growing and growing. Mm -hmm. Could prevent it by using 
more suitable distance, maybe a border of Danby plus 10 miles. Mine was kind of a corollary because I thought, you know, it would be great to see Danby not just be a monoculture of houses, but to be more inclusive and diverse. But how do you, how do you integrate things like wineries and breweries and cideries and such um, without having a negative impact on residential um, properties. I mean, as we've seen see anyway, do you? with um, the cidery, I mean, it's wildly successful, but it does have an impact on traffic and neighbors and yet at the same time, it adds so much. So how, how do we kind of create that balance or achieve that balance? Um, can, let's see, can you guys hear me? Yep. Okay, hi. So um, I just want to relate some information that could be helpful. Ex the experience we had about uh, renting out the gallery, which is we closed the gallery. We got kind of tired of people coming and going all the time and just wanted to simplify things. So we've rented both spaces. The first space is going to be the smaller space is rented to a photographer opening a studio there and he's going to be teaching classes there and the second space i'm really excited the big space is going to be rented to a guy who teaches martial arts and he's going to offer classes to adults but and focus really on children so i think that's really cool but what i wanted to relate is the experience i had of who looked at the space the people that came out and were interested nobody was interested i didn't get one call about somebody wanting to open a store you know just none but I did get people that were interested in finding cheaper space than Ithaca. Um, a woman was interested in opening an occupational therapy office. Uh, someone wanted to open a big uh, community acupuncture office there. We had one guy that wanted to run a, have a warehouse kind of space. Uh, he turns over a lot of like Airbnb and things like that. So I was just thinking about how we create like if there were more spaces like that to rent, I think you could create some synergy of more people being in business in town and working there. And, and then that could be the base. And, and then if there's more people working and then more customers or whatever, then you, you create, then you do have more of a base for stores and coffee shops or whatever, something like that. Oh, the other one was a the uh, that was interested was the um, the toy library where they rent toys, but I think they figured that was too far away. And I think some people mm -hmm. felt like the our space was too far from town. But then when they drove out there, they realized that it's a really pretty fast drive from town, and there's parking, and and so that might kind of be something we need to talk about instead of like olivia said just houses and stores that there are people that have a lot of unique businesses in ithaca and tompkins county that um are comfortable being out here they don't need to be downtown and um i don't did we talk about any areas or lots in town that could be develop do you have anything like that in your mind you guys like what area what you know i know we have that core business area where olivia has her property in there but yeah where else could you put uh, some kind of is there land enough places available around other than if olivia's is more of a residential kind of thing i don't Ups know i'm just Rick so anyway, that's just my experience. I wanted to put that out there to you guys in terms of this whole thought process of trying to create a more of a core community of DMB. And some of the people that were interested in space lived right on Gunderman Road. They're like, oh my God, I could walk to work. So there's a lot of people, business owners in Danby that would be happy having their businesses in Danby if they had their proper space. And I just want to finish by saying that we have a very small septic system and we don't know about our well and the VRBO guy and the um, acupuncture people, they needed laundry and we didn't, we couldn't 
we didn't know if that would be feasible. So anyway, um, that's just what I wanted to share with you guys. It was kind of an interesting experience we had. Mm -hmm. Does anyone have any questions about that? Or comments or ideas? So Nancy, you said that the one of the biggest draws was that your price is cheaper than um, other things in the area. Um, what do you think would happen if you tried to build a new building and charge that low price that you're able to charge with your existing building? I haven't really thought about it like that in terms of uh, square footage, what we charge. I think I charge like, I don't know, $15, $16 a square foot, which is kind of comparable, but um, I, that would be an interesting exercise to work on though, David, like what you're saying. It would depend on where, how much you bought the property for and you know, all that kind of, what kind of building you yeah, built. Cross the construction, right. Yeah, construction is so expensive right now. Is there any place that could be converted into something like for more of those kinds of things is what I'm kind of, I don't know. So um, I don't, I think that was a parking was a big thing too in the ease of driving out here. So when we talk about promoting Danby, it's a, even though we're kind of farther from town than it, than, but it's a fast drive. It's an easy drive, you know? I mean, it's faster to get into demand. Damn it, when it's 40 miles an hour. But overall, it's pretty unencumbered by stoplights and things like that, is what I'm saying. Yeah, there's very little traffic anywhere in DMV. And it's very Relatively quick to get speaking. out here. <laughs> but I, I, what's that? Relatively speaking. <laughs> There's very little traffic in Ithaca, if we're relatively speaking, but there's no traffic in DNB. Um, but you know, I, I do think we want to be careful about what we see as the value that we can bring as a community. And I, I hope the value the proposition that we have isn't um, cheapest and most parking, because I, I don't think that that's a winning um, strategy for community development. Um, I think we've seen that fail lots of places like the current Lansing Mall. Um, that's, that's true, but if we're trying to create some kind of core businesses, I'm just saying there are people interested in finding business spaces to rent that are less expensive than downtown. And there's not a lot of availability of spaces downtown anyway for a certain size, I'd say, most people are comfortable with 750, 750 square feet, something like that, mm -hmm. in and about that, 500 to 1,000. Yeah, yeah. I think it'd be really cool to get a bunch of artists out here. I think that'd be really sweet. Have a, like a lot of art studios. The artist mall. Yeah, I uh, spent some time in Peekskill, New York, and they actually had a special uh, law that they passed for encouraging artists and, and uh, I think requiring people in this with like upstairs spaces in the downtown to, re to rent to artists at certain rates and so on. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I, I'm a little wary of using uh, artists because they're so often the precursors of gentrification, but uh, We'll set that aside. I, I did want to comment about the uh, what we've done this evening um, in that um, what I'd, I'd hoped to see more was that people would imagine uh, either their own property or property near them or the property that they, that they knew and make a proposal which actually specifically uh, showed the impact of the zoning on that property. Mm -hmm. And maybe maybe after the meeting, people could think about those sorts of scenarios. So rather than actually um, giving particular uh, broad concerns, uh, actually create scenarios uh, for properties that they know and understand uh, as to how the, the zoning might particularly affect them. 
Yeah, I think that that, that is really the intention. And um, I hope it is something that people can put some thought into um, because that's something we can really actually test. So if, if you have a sense of what you think could be done under the current rules and what you think could be done under the proposed rules, and you can lay that out in this format and send it to me, um, then we can evaluate, is that actually true? Can you actually do what you think can be done under the proposed rules? And is what you think it is allowed under the current rules true? Um, so far, when I've talked to people, most people don't understand how much development is allowed by the current rules um, and how much just you could cover the entire town in five acre lots um, if you wanted to and if the demand was there. We know that we're not seeing a huge amount of that because the demand um, isn't super high. So no matter what we do, we're not going to have a huge jump in development, what we are going to have is a change in the character of the, the development that does happen. So we um, can alter that incremental pace of how places are changing and what kind of place we're evolving into. Do we want to evolve, evolve towards a town that is 100% five acre lots, or do we want to evolve towards a town? that's more small clusters with large open space around them? Um, or do we want to evolve into a town that's all two acre lots or all one acre lots? Um, what, what is the end total build out of the pr proposed rules that you'd like to see and what, what's gonna happen with it? Um, we know that whatever rules we have, development will continue to be relatively slow in DNB. It's a slow chipping away of the character, um, but it is happening. And, you know, we see uh, around 15 new houses every year. And, um, you know, in a big town that's spread out, but you chip off pieces five acres at a time. Um, it does lead to a significant change in character over time. And everyone who's lived here for a long time sees it and says it in every survey that they get that we need to stop the change in the loss of the rural character. Um, so I, I think, um, what was it, Ben? What Ben said is exactly true. What we're trying to get to with this exercise is what's a real thing that could happen? Are you afraid that your neighbor or a lot down the block from you could develop 10 units on it? You know, let's think about it. Let's see if it's allowed under the zoning. Let's see what's allowed today. Let's see what's allowed with the proposal. Um, and, um, you know, I, I know I've heard a lot of concern, a lot of people worried about this concept of transfer of development rights, but I wanna make sure that we get back to the fact that when we're transferring development rights in um, rural one or rural two, for each development right, um, we're protecting a large amount of land and we started off by reducing the amount of development in half, um, the total amount of development. Um, so it, it'd be useful to think about that and think about some specific scenarios and really test it out. Because um, that's the point of this is to be able to definitively look at something and say, is that true? Is that really something that can happen or something that can't happen? And it's hard to do that with just kind of broad. I'm afraid that something could happen. We need, we need actual things to test. And I think that that's why we convened this meeting is that I've heard people say, I know that someone creative is going to come up with something bad that I'm not going to like. Well, let's see it. What is that thing? And then we can evaluate it as a community and see if it's really possible um, or if it's not. Because we've gone through, we've gone through a lot of those concerns in um, the many, many hours of meetings that we've had already where someone said, 
well, I think this could happen. And then we actually go to look at the parcel and where they were really concerned that there was gonna be a big increase in development, there was the potential of three houses instead of the current potential of six houses. You know, So I think it really helps when we can compare to something actually on the ground and see, see how that works out. Um, so I, I think that's kind of homework for everyone. Um, think about something real, a real project that could happen that you would like or that you wouldn't like and describe it on this form and send it to me and, and we can think about it with the town board as this um, proposal to adopt different zoning moves forward. And if something really bad happens, you know, that's, we wanna find those things and we want to make adjustments in the code so that they're not possible. David, David something... could, could you possibly do one or two worked examples to, uh, which would both sort of demonstrate what you think the law is doing and, and also give us kind of a form for, uh, um, for our own speculations. Sure. So, like right now. What, well, uh, not Maybe necessarily. Right. Something out? What, while we may wait, but yeah, I mean, yeah, we'll post, post it on the website. Or, sure. Um, um, I want to give you uh, an example. I, I'm here at 194 East Miller Road. We have a big barn. If we wanted to turn it into a wedding venue. Would we be able to do that if we wanted to turn our current residence into a, a restaurant, you know, a rural restaurant? I mean, I'm not saying that I would do these things. I'm just saying, you know, those are the kinds of things that I would throw out. We're in the middle of an ag district, but also residential. Um, so those are just some of the things that I would put out there as hypotheticals. But I wanted to just raise another issue, David, and that's also the whole issue of Transparency and communication. So right now there are certain um, requirements if somebody is going to undertake um, either a subdivision or you know some new, whether it's you know solar installation or you know there, you you inform people within 500 feet. So Eric decides he wants now to go ahead and subdivide his property into these 10 units, which are going to have a major impact on my traffic um, through the farm. So I, I think we really need to be thinking about how to communicate or how to inform residents of these projects and and allow, you know, for more input. I and mean, we have, you know, we're trying to create zoning that says, okay, this is the zoning. Now you can go ahead and do what you want, pretty much, um, as long as it conforms. But, you know. I mean, just ex examples just within the last six months of, of, you know, my being, you know, in Danby is a solar installation, which has completely affected my um, line of vision into the countryside, a huge new polar barn, big, you know, um, pole barn, sorry, that uh, obstructs the view. Um, and you know, so, and, and I had I had nothing to say, except, I mean, I was able to have input into the um, solar installation because it went to the BZA. But I think there's somehow for people who have lived here and have tried, you know, pay their taxes and, and are working to, you know, to maintain their quality of life, that somehow there has to be just more communication or more opportunity for people to have some kind of input and that it's not just a slam dunk. You go to the planning board, you you know, you comply with the zoning regulations and now you put up, you know, your big new building. So I, I hear what you're saying, Olivia, and I, I hear this a lot. So I, I think it's worth addressing. I hear a lot of people say, I should be able to have a voice in whether or not property that I live near is developed. I should be able to go to a meeting about land that somebody else owns and decide outside of the rules whether or not they can do what's allowed. And I know that that's something that everyone feels Hi, like David, they would like. but have input. Yeah. Well, I mean, what do you mean by have input well, if it's not deciding? Clearly, I mean, I can't decide for another property owner, but to have an opportunity 
to let that property owner know how I feel and whether there's some kind of compromise, whether there's some kind of an opportunity for either moving something, you know, one direction or the other, or, I mean, that there's some kind of dialogue and conversation and it's not just, you know, a, a done deal. Yeah, so I think it's really important to help everyone understand that that is the way zoning and property rights work. The place that we as a community have input is in setting the rules. And once the rules are set, people have the right to build based on those rules. And that's, and we don't have a right to impose additional costs on them just because we're there first, right? They can't come and say, well, my house is here now and I can see your garage, so you need to put a bunch of trees around it, um, right? That would seem ridiculous because you were there first. Um, but by the same token, once, once we have the rules that says someone's allowed to build a house there, they're allowed to build a house there. And, you know, we built in, we build into the zoning, the criteria that the planning board applies um, when evaluating a site plan, if it's something that rises to the level of having a site plan. But generally a house in most of the zones, um, except for the rural one, doesn't require a site plan review um, because that would be significant imposition of government in the fairly simple decisions that people are making. Um, and if the town wanted to impose site plan review on every building in every zone, uh, you are the town is allowed to do that. But I don't think that there's the political will to do that. Although I do frequently hear from people, I think that I should have a say in everything that happens near my house. Um, so far, I, I don't hear a lot of people who want that for themselves. Mm -hmm. So I, I think right now, Anytime someone wants a variance, there's notification of neighbors. And anytime someone subdivides, there's notification of neighbors and there's a process to come and give input um, because those are things that the town has a say in. Um, or when somebody wants to do something that's on the site plan review or special permit list, which is larger impact things, um, but for the lower impact things, like putting up a garage or building a single family house, um, the town has given that right to every property in town um, to be able to do it. Mm -hmm. And so if, if that's something people want to change, you know, they, I strongly doubt that there is political will to make that change. Um, but, you know, to propose it, we could put it in and see. What well, adding the works. design guidelines for the hamlet is also a major step forward in that regard. It's being uh, a level of right, but that doesn't apply. It doesn't apply to Olivia's. No, it doesn't. Part. But but, it, but it's a uh, it's a level of constraint that we haven't previously been willing to entertain. I mean, it was, the, the, the commercial design guidelines were the first foray into controlling what people put up on their properties, uh, expanding that to include residential properties in the, in the hamlets and in the hamlet neighborhood zones is, is a, an expansion of that, uh, that, that is aimed at uh, ensuring that, 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 you know, when an area is developed, that the, the, the quality of the construction is, is going to be something that people are going to see as an asset rather than a degradation of their local environment. Should we extend it into the into the rural um, part of the town, uh, you know, it, it might be worth a conversation, but but uh, it hasn't been it hasn't been promoted as of yet, anyway. I don't think that a neighborhood that saying that you um, notify the neighbors when you're only notifying people within 500 feet is really notifying the neighbors, particularly if we go to five acre lots all over or even at 10 acre lots uh, then people will be even farther away from each other but the other night I was outside in the dark and I could hear the people over on Howland Road talking and they weren't yelling 
and they I could hear what they were saying and that's half a mile away so you know what goes on they become my neighbors when that happens and if they want to build something that's going to be very noisy or whatever then I feel that I should be notified yeah I think that was partly Olivia's point was that the notification should be broader than it is at the moment because at the moment it's really very narrow right no olivia and i have always agreed on that i mean that goes way back i mean just like with the solar installation potentially on um bald hill road i mean everybody across the valley will be affected by that but we don't have anything to say we're the ones who will be looking at it Everyone, uh, I, everyone has the ability to come and make comments to the town board. I mean, if they had, know it's going on, that's the point. If right, they know exactly. it's going on, and not everybody spends their time monitoring the town website or whatever, or the or the Facebook page yeah. or whatever. Well, there's there's a real trade-off in costs. You know, they, every things. notification takes a lot of dollars and not all of those dollars are passed on to the applicant. So every expansion that we make of that um, is costing the town money. So that's the-, the Really, kind of it costs a lot of money to put envelopes in the mail. That doesn't it does, it takes, you're paying, you're paying a person with a master's degree to stuff envelopes. <laughs> well, we could put it online. I mean, we have a new website now. I mean, yeah. So put everything online and people just go back and check periodically. I mean, I only happened to find out about the Bald Hill project roundabout. Well, it wasn't because I didn't mention it in the supervisor's update in the Danby area news. I uh, found multiple times. <laughs> and it's definitely it's been in, on the website. In fact, we made a special part of the website just for it. Right, well, well we're, we're, we're I, I would be happy to, to allow to I'd be happy to allow David to you to email me uh, if it would help expand yeah. the range of these uh, notifications. Uh, and I think that it, the town should be asking people, would you like to be notified of these things via email? And those people who are interested can provide their email addresses and those who aren't, they won't. I think that's a fantastic idea. Yes. I That's what the city does, actually. I live in the city, and I signed up for all the lists of things that I'm interested in, and I get notifications, and nobody has to come knock on my door. Great. Yes, and there's a place right on the town website that says, would you like to hear from us? Put in your email. Yep. Now, to, to come back to the cost of actually mailing them, you don't have to do it yourself, David. You could perhaps... Um, ask one of the town clerks, uh, you paid employees to do that. I mean, there, there's really no, no significant cost to mailing out a few more. And if there were, you could probably add it to the application fee. It, it, well, it, if it, we, it, so, ask, but, but it is not very expensive. And 1500 if, feet seems very reasonable. 500 is ridiculous, even with two acre average lots. Depends on where you are in town. In some places, it's not very many people. In other places, it's a lot. Yeah, well, well out, out by me, 500 feet gets me one neighbor out. Yeah, yeah, but around me, it's a lot more. Right? Yeah, well, in Portland, that's two blocks. Mm -hmm. Well, then but we're not in Portland. <laughs> we're in Danby. Maybe Camille, you're muted. Camille, Camille, you're, you're muted. I just want to say I found this very interesting the way you you organize the session tonight with question and answers like that and talking about them, it was really interesting. And I feel like I know a lot more now. It was a good process. Thanks, Camille. Thank um, we, we have a, an email list. I don't know if you heard about this from the email list, but if you want to be added to it, uh, my email is planner at danby.ny.gov. And there's yes. also a spot on the website you can sign Put up. Put me on that list. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. I I think I think that's an excellent prompt from Camille that we have hit nine o'clock, mm -hmm. and uh, we have also 
um, gone through what we came to discuss. I would really like people to um, do some more thinking about this exercise and see if you can apply it in a more concrete way and send examples to me. Um, and I will be sharing them with the town board and we'll go through this with the town board and evaluate um, the, the severity of concerns that people have. I think that's important and I, I want to address it in a way that's um, organized and comprehensive and specific. Um, so thank you all for participating and I hope you'll continue the conversation and um, I will be posting this tool on the website, on the planning department at the bottom under current projects, there's a list of links for zoning update and it will go there. And then I'll email it out as well. So thanks so much for all your time um, and have a good night. Thank you, David. Thank you, David, that was great. Thanks, David. Bye. David. Bye. Mm-hmm. <laughs>